All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, could you put your thumbs up if this volume is good and you can hear me in the back? Or do you want me to speak up a little bit more? So, so. Okay. I'll turn it up a notch. Uh, first off, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's uh, towards the end of the day, but uh, it's, you know, personally, it's so great to see everyone in full swing after the last couple of years we've had. So really good to have you all here. And I am joined today by Kineret from Blah Blah Car. And would be great to hear from you, Kineret. Sure. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me, likewise. Uh, I'm Kineret. I'm uh, here on behalf of Blah Blah Car. We're the biggest community-based car sharing platform in the world. Um, the carpooling um, is our core product, but we also have a line of buses and we sell bus tickets um, throughout the world. And uh, I've been working at Blabacar for three years. I started as data engineering manager, so I managed a central data warehouse of only data engineers. And today I'm a horizontal lead of uh, the analytics. Cool. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm Karthik. I'm leading the team out here in EMEA for Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is a data observability solution. Uh, so what is data observability? Uh, you can pretty much sum it up as a organization's ability to understand the health of their data. Just as much as we used to think about the health of our infrastructure, we now have to think about data in similar terms and data observability lets you do that. And Monte Carlo is a solution that allows you to first detect any issues that could be present in your data in a fully automated manner, and then help you get to the resolution quickly, and then finally helps you to also prevent data quality issues going forward. So that's um, in summary what uh, Monte Carlo does. And uh, maybe we can start with uh, something fun. Uh, I don't know if you all have heard about Blah Blah Car before. Uh, I personally have. I've uh, taken some rides on buses and whatnot. So I was really curious, what's the longest route that you could possibly take if you were to do the car share and buses and whatnot? I'm curious if you guys have measured that before. So speaking of buses first. We operate a bus line in France and Western Europe. So you can take a bus from Seville to Milan uh, for it's 450 kilometers. It would save you a plane. It would save a carbon footprint and uh, it would be longer in terms of time. But um, that's our longest ride today on the bus. And uh, on carpool, um, funny story, this was 2017. So before um, the political issues in Eastern Europe, um, but a uh, driver posted a ride from uh, Brest, which is a city, Brest is a city in uh, France, uh, and uh, up to Russia, a city in Russia, and it was a 44-day trip. Uh, it was published on the news and people were following this trip. Somebody actually booked that trip. After 44 days, they reached their destination and there was a crowd waiting and cheering the, the driver and the passenger. But uh, yeah, this was in uh, old days, but uh, today you can take uh, a ride anywhere in Western Europe and um, in Eastern, it's a different story today. Amazing. Yeah, I know uh, in the UK, we're all uh, starting to discover all spots in uh, you know all over UK and hopefully one day we can get to do that here as well uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, data at blah blah car uh, the first thing is I, I feel like every company has uh, you know this philosophy about data uh, some want to make every decision about data and some it's more of a supporting function what is it like at blah blah car so uh we're a marketplace. We connect drivers and passengers, for the carpool at least. So it's a C2C business. And so we have direct contact with our consumers on both sides. So we must incorporate data. It's impossible to make a decision based on an anecdote, like on one ride from uh, France to Russia. That is not a statistical point. So data is, in, is the backbone of our business. We have data incorporated throughout our funnel from marketing to support and throughout the product. And uh, we use machine learning and ML uh, for many years now, actually. Like, I think we were 
pretty uh, pioneers in that sense. Um, and uh, we use it primarily to match the driver and the passenger. Got it, got it. Uh, and in terms of how you support those things, like do you have one team or is there sort of a team structure that works for you? So we, we've recently reorganized as uh, Data Mesh within the Data Org. So um, our data organization is a part of engineering. We report to, to the CTO. Um, and uh, within our mesh organization, we have teams that are we call squads. Each team rep is a, represents a business domain. For example, the carpool supply team or the carpool demand team, which is passengers. Um, and in every squad, we have a data engineer, a software engineer, not a, but maybe multiple, a data analyst and a data scientist. And then we also have a foundations team that's responsible for tooling and streaming and, uh, and ingestion. Gotcha. And, you know, data mesh is everywhere these days. And I feel like there were some warriors in the data world who took on data decentralization for a long time. Uh, and I feel like companies uh, were either already in the path of adopting something a bit more decentralized uh, or it really was the data mesh that triggered it. What was it at Blabacar? So for us, we, we read the article, the, okay. the article published by Zamak um, around two years ago. So we read it in a delay of uh, a couple months. Um, and uh, at the time, we weren't looking for a solution per se, but we were experiencing problems um, that we realized would be solved by by this new concept, by this like socio-technical uh, concept. We were organized as, we had this central warehouse. We were at uh, maximum capacity in terms of resources. Like our team, my team was huge. Um, nine, like 10 data engineers in one team and we found it hard to, to separate them. Like some were doing ingestion, some were doing modeling. So we tried to separate that a little bit. Uh, we tried to put domain expertise um, on each person, but still it, something was not working. We were slow on delivery. We were disconnected from the business teams. Uh, we were slow to understand the changes in priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, the data engineers were also like um, distressed about it. And so were the consumers. Um, moreover, we had a lot of data quality issues. So things were breaking, metrics were not correct. Uh, I'm not, it's not like chaos, but it was, it was not ideal. And 50% of our problems were found by our consumers saying, hey, this doesn't look right. Can you please look into it? And we'd look into it in a really like not optimal time. So it really clicked when we read about it. Amazing. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into data quality and uh, data observability. Uh, but I'm curious, apart from uh, that piece of the stack, what else makes up the bigger tool set of a successful data mesh? Like, wh what do you think has been uh, very effective for you guys? In terms of tooling? Yes. Um, look, if, if you're going to separate your central team, you must have a set of some kind of governance. You have to have a strong set of governance. Uh, if you're going to separate your data engineers or whatever data profession uh, from working together every day, coding together in the same standard in the same way, you have to have some kind of contract between them or co some kind of mutual understanding between them, how they write things, how they build things. Otherwise, it's you're going to lose all your flexibility if you want if you're some if somebody's leaving and you want to replace them by somebody else super quick or your priorities change or you want to open a new domain then you're going to still be slow to respond and then you you're just multiplying your pre-existing problem so i would say data governance is is a tool that like is is something that you need to build either with tools or in house as you wish right and is there a bit of a carrot and stick approach to that uh, in terms of benefits of your domains uh, following certain sort of data governance principles, or is it very much the stick approach? What, uh, what, what's sort of the balance there? Um, I wonder, 
like you're asking for giving incentives to the domains right, to act right, exactly. in that way. I I would say they 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 prefer like we in domains. I'm working very closely with a domain. We would prefer to have tooling brought to us. We don't have time for that. We want to deliver. Okay. And we want to deliver fast. So we would we're happy to have some kind of governance um, infrastructure. And it's easy to, to, again, to change people. We literally play musical chairs okay. in some quarters and we can because we have this set of tools and we're not done yet with this uh, t building of the tools. But right. Um, right. I would say we're halfway there and we realize the importance of it. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Um, now, moving on to data observability and data quality, uh, what sort of trigger the conversations around that? I know you talked about data quality issues, but beyond that, specific to the data mesh, how does observability play into that? So at the time, this was like 18 months ago, when we realized we had two main problems. One was scaling, because we started from this core product of carpooling, and then we suddenly acquired this bus line, blah, blah, bus today. And then we acquired super quickly another company, and suddenly we had multiple modes of transportation, and it took us a year to uh, add everything into the wa central warehouse. And everything is built around this one core um, product, so it, it looked bad. <laughs> so, and we realize if we want to, if the company is going to add more modes of transportation, we're, we're really stuck. So we need to find a way to scale better. That was one problem. And the second problem was data quality. Uh, we realized we had a problem. Um, it's, it, at Blabacar, we're very, like, uh, w we have these templates to how to define a problem. So we really framed it and, and did um, a lot of research on what, what is our problem. It stemmed from the fact that our data engineering team had a lot of run. And uh, as I said, we were like 10 people. And still, like, it didn't help. Like, you add another person, it doesn't help. So we realized it's something fundamental. Um, so we looked into it, and we realized that it was coming from data quality, data issues popping up. Uh, we started interviewing all the data teams, like the consumers, the data scientists, the engineering, and we asked them, how long does it take for you in a quarter to resolve, um, to find the root cause of, um, of data quality issues? And we came to a sum of 200 hours a quarter for the aggregate amount. Um, that's a lot. So we realized we had a big problem on data quality. Then if you break down the data quality issue and you want to try to solve it, you say, okay, first step is what is the state of the health of my organization? We, had, we didn't have a good visibility on what it was. I mean, we, we saw when they were failures, we had, an, like, we had airflow tasks failing, we knew there was a problem, fine. We were measuring KPIs with an internal tool, that, a monitoring KPI tool that we built in-house. But it doesn't tell you the full landscape. And this is how we realized data observability is what we need. And then we started uh, researching that topic specifically. Got it, got it. Yeah, we hear that very often where the unknown unknowns that are out there which is influencing your data quality so much which you can't often really go out and plan to find them it just it's there and it's affecting your data quality uh it's definitely something we you know we've heard uh, quite a bit uh would be really good to hear about how you came across monte carlo uh you know what really sure. should influence your decision there and things like that Sure, okay, so just mo like continuing the data observability issue. So we looked online. I like to write, read like articles and like newsletters that are, that, that are, you know, now in the last year, it feels like there's this mini revolution of information and tools and uh, I like to be, you know, on it. So um, I, I read about Monte Carlo as, and we demoed it as much as we demoed uh, other companies as well. That's how we, we heard about it. Um, and uh, what we liked about it was the fact that we don't have to code anything from the start. We just plug it and uh, like there's not much setup. We were again, we were at our maximum and we didn't want to like, we, we didn't want to add any more dev work to our teams because they were already overloaded. Uh, so we like that within two weeks we already had an alerting system in place. And then when you know in our own time we added our custom 
SQL. Um, and when moving into the data mesh, um, it was really helpful because we had all these lineage features and key asset features that um, that uh, were really helpful in, in like uh, breaking down into domains. But I see that it's time to talk about the stack. <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's please do that. All right. So this is what Blavacar stack looks like. Uh, in terms of data sources, I we broke it down into like. Uh, um, there was production databases that we're ingesting on a daily, like copy pasting on a daily basis, basically. And then we're streaming data from internal tools, um, front end um, events, back end events, and domain events. And then external data sources. So we have multiple data, mul marketing data sources, and Zendesk for support, and uh, um, not anything uh, special here. A little bit on the transportation, a lot of like transportation specific. Uh, data sources for tooling. So we have uh, Rivery as a third party um, API manager. So it really saves us time developing uh, new, when we need a new data source as soon as possible, we just plug it in. And we use Airflow for orchestration and, um, and transformation of uh, the data. Then uh, we, our warehouse is in uh, BigQuery and uh, storage, we use GCP. It's our, uh, it's our uh, platform. And then uh, for visualization, our go-to would be Tableau, but we also would use Data Studio. It's a Google uh, product. It's free, so it's easy to share with anybody. And uh, at Lovacar, not everybody's using Tableau, so it's easy. If it's data for the masses. It's a good, um, it's a good shortcut. And then uh, for data observability, uh, this is like uh, our uh, addition from the last year. So we added. Uh, so we have Monte Carlo. Um, I know you mentioned about key asset scores and things like that. Was there anything specifically that kind of stood out where it was really a bit of a game changer for your team? Yeah. Um, so I think the number one thing is the out of the box um, solution. That uh, again, it's uh, you don't have to think much in order to have an alerting system and have your state of the health like of your platform uh, visible. And uh, yeah, so again, when we when we moved, when we decided we're moving to the data mesh, the first thing we did was defining the problem as Wabakar likes in a template and very organized. The second thing we did was to define what are our business domains. And in order to do that, we used Monte Carlo's lineage um, because it, it really helped to understand dependencies uh, between the domains. Again, like everything was built around carpool core and it was really like the warehouse was like a spaghetti that is still at the moment being untangled. We are not finished untangling it, but uh, the lineage tool is super helpful to understand what's going on. We had over 10,000 uh, tables, so uh, it was impossible to do that manually. And then um, another feature that we used a lot was the key asset, I think it's called. Right. Um, Which kind of tells you what tables are being used the most, yes. the importance of it and things so like that. So it really rates like your tables by most important to least important and then it allowed us to just cut out thousands of tables that we did not use and that was super helpful. If, if you're reorganizing, you're, you're going to have to move all these tables somewhere so it really saved us time in that sense. Got it, that was got cool. It. Um, and maybe, you know, you started talking about you actually measuring the time it took for teams? Like, were there specific KPIs that you're starting to think about, like the time you're taking to detect these issues or anything like that, that maybe the yeah. crowd here would benefit from? So it's hard to quantify these things, obviously. It's, uh, it's funny how like data teams find it hardest to quantify their own KPIs. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing that we want to improve and uh, we're still uh, working on measurement of that is the percent of data quality issues that are found by us versus our consumers. We don't want consumers to to find the data issues because it means it's too late, basically. If they found it, somebody already made a decision based on that, and then it's too late. Not to mention it breaks our trust. Uh, it's really easy to break trust in uh, in data. Um, so so this is a metric we really want to to make sure that is improving. And other than that, it's it, again, it's hard to quantify, but we we have anecdotal issues uh, that we see that were found by the system, and we're not like if if it wasn't for Monte Carlo, honestly, 
nobody would have found him or maybe somebody along the road but too late again so it saves time uh, to like to to resolve because we've we found it the day after and we don't have to like backfill months of data that was wrong um, so it saves time money and it saves resources too because there was all these like 200 hours that we measured before that that were just on investigating the root cause so that time is basically cut to zero because nobody needs to investigate too much. You have the root cause right in front of you because you have the whole lineage in front of you. Awesome, awesome. Um, just a couple of more questions and then uh, we'd love to hear from uh, the group as well if you all have any questions. Uh, the first thing is uh, one thing we hear often by adopting a data mesh and data observability uh, and increasing the trust in data it really opens the doors to quickly produce data products. And the ones that are very exciting are the customer facing ones. And I'm curious, like Blaba, at Blabacar, is there anything in the horizon that you're thinking about? And especially what the data mesh has unlocked for you? It would, would be cool to hear about that. Yeah, so um, again, the, the point of our data mesh, like our, our main goal in mind was to scale easily, more easily. So if we add more modes of transportation or any new line of business, it would be easier to do. Um, I'm not, I don't think I can talk about our like right. next mode of transportation, but it's coming up. And uh, we really want to be like this door to door, uh, like uh, community transport. But anyway, um, like with the data mesh, what we've seen, we, we've done a POC on the data mesh. We didn't, today we're completely organized as a mesh, but at the time we said let's start with a POC so we decided which team would do it it was the marketing domain we put we like selected a data two data engineers two data scientists two data analysts a software engineer okay you go here you or you op you operate as the mesh and uh, we'll continue doing our thing and then we'll collect our feedback how's it going for you for three months and then we'll make a decision so we found um, after three months we talked to all the individual contributors and the manager to, to understand how it works the b best thing that happened there was that their delivery got faster so they they just they they just delivered more and uh, faster and uh, they all reported that it was uh, much easier to work this way on the downside however we found that um, a lot of the individuals working in these mesh teams were worried that uh, they're the lone the only professional of their sort on the team. We call it the lone expert syndrome. And uh, we've thought a lot how to solve this. Um, what this means is like, okay, I'm the only data engineer here. What, like, like who do I, who do I code with? What if I wanna talk to somebody or, or consult with somebody on, on a architectural question, there's nobody to talk to. Um, so what we did is we, while we, moved into these meshes, like the domains that are vertical, you can see them. So we have also horizontal groups that we call chapters, um, and we strengthen these as well. So if you're a data analyst in, the, in, in one of our domains, you report to this domain manager and you're, uh, you're, you're in this domain team, but at least once a week, and you have a Slack channel and uh, peers that you know well, you will cooperate with your fellow data analysts and you can muse about like uh, specific issues of, of yours. So this is our version of the data mesh, I would say, I and uh, a pitfall that we kind of avoided. Awesome, awesome. Uh, cool, so we got about five minutes. Uh, we'd love to open it up for questions. Uh, maybe first off, uh, you know, anybody or whoever here is thinking about uh, data quality and suddenly it's sort of become a lot more important. Would love to see some show of hands. Uh, it, well, there's at least one person back there. There's a few here. Uh, yeah, so maybe, you know, whoever had their hands up would love to hear from you. I think it was, yeah. Like what's kind of triggered the emphasis now and then maybe any questions from you as well would uh, would love to hear about. Yeah, I, I, I think, is that on? Yeah, uh, so for us, it's um, probably a little bit higher. Hello? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so for us, it's, it's just the, the time to investigate root cause. It's problems being reported to us rather than us, us finding those problems. 
and then looking at our spaghetti in, in the warehouse, um, seeing the huge lineage and trying to track down the problem. Um, yeah, I think that's that's where we're at, at the moment, looking looking at solutions that don't you know consume so much time. I didn't have a specific question, but oh, okay, never mind. That Anybody sounds exactly that? where we were. <laughs> and I, honestly, we're not done. We still have most of the spaghetti to untangle. Um, but yeah, uh, lineage and root cause analysis um, are things. Happy to say that they're. Uh, in the past. Anyone else with a question? There we go. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. okay. Uh, I would like to ask regarding the data observability piece that currently if you if you have a uh, data quality problems or something with the data, who is owning the data quality? Is it is it also like split per domain that the supply domain is owning their data pieces and they are defining and solving the data quality if, if it appears is it like that so yes um, every data domain owns spe a specific part of the warehouse so basically we had this one warehouse and we just spent many hours to be honest trying to divide in the right way so that every domain okay you own these tables and this is you and like you refer to this um, you know, ex uh, spreadsheet <laughs> if you have any doubt. And then uh, with Monte Carlo, you just create domains. And then you can say, okay, this is my uh, whatever fraud domain. So all the fraud tables uh, alerts, I want you to report to me and I want you to send to Slack all the alerts that have to do with that. To this day, actually, even this week, like we had one alert and I was like, why do we own this? This is not, shouldn't be our problem. So we're still like uh, finalizing those ownerships, but at least. We settled that at the start. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem of like a uh, hot potato, right? Everybody's going to say they're not the owner. And yeah, and, and across some of our customers, we've seen uh, like even more, I would say, uh, I don't know if maturity is the right word, but basically we're hearing things like data contracts where it's more of a carrot approach that if you want to be part of this amazing mesh, then here are all the things that you need to abide by and you are the data steward who will have a data contract with that central team and that contract involves things like SLIs and certain KPIs that you need to meet and so on and so forth. But long story short, the ownership, what we see across our customers is still at the domain level in terms of uh, reacting to these issues and resolving them and so on. Uh, yeah, so thank you guys for the overview. Um, uh, a little you bit. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned how you kind of, I guess you, you said fully implemented data mesh, but one thing I've noticed today, a key theme with the principles has been everyone's talking very high level. So I was hoping to just go down one piece. Um, how far are you in terms of implementing all four of them at the same point? Because I can imagine if you take domain ownership, you can push that further than, say, for example, the com computational governance, because that requires a lot more, well, in my head anyway, it requires a lot more effort. So which ones have you found to be the stronger ones you'd be able to push forward, and which ones have been more difficult for yourself then? You mean out of the four principles of uh, yeah, I guess, data mesh? Yeah, the four principles, and then, you know, yeah. how that fits into your kind of, like, strategic output going forward. Yeah, so I would say, like, on domain ownership, I could answer, I guess, uh, in the best way. We're, we're not done yet. We, we went a long way to define the, the business ownerships of the domains. Great. Horizon like organizationally, we're done. And uh, on paper, we're done. But technically, we have not done much yet. That is the hard part. That is actually uh, taking apart the, the, the central monolith um, as well. We things that we still have done and we need to is to set up contracts like uh, like Karthik was just saying like to set up car contracts between the domains okay you own this but you owe me this by 7 a.m. every day uh, because I need that or whatever um, and uh, have SLOs by domain because there are like interdependencies between them and that's okay so on that it'll take another uh, safe to say like six months at least honestly I think we're uh, out of time. 
for questions, but I hope you all enjoyed uh, the session. And we are just a couple of aisles down here if you want to come meet us. And uh, Kinneret, I believe, is going to be around tomorrow as well. Yeah. And uh, we're also having a data, uh, a beer session, basically, after this. So please uh, find us at the booth. You'll have these cards which will tell you where it's taking place. And hope you all can join to have some beers with us. So. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thank <laughs> you.